so much of James Thurber's writing was so original, so inventive, so much a standard setter for even the humorists who write today, that we can't forget just how good it is. And nothing focused his pen like dogs. And perhaps nowhere in his volumes of work is that focus clearer than in tonight's selection. This is from My World and Welcome to It, first published in 1937, and I'm reading it from a 1979 paperback version of the book. Listen carefully as Thurber goes from humor to sarcasm to nostalgia to a deft, remarkable analysis of the universal dilemma that is mortality in Memorial by James Thurber. She came all the way from Illinois by train in a big wooden crate 13 years ago, a frightened black poodle, not yet a year old. She felt terrible in body and worse in mind. These contraptions that men intervention of that law of nature which holds that the feet must come in contact with the ground in traveling dismayed her. She was never able to ride 1,000 yards in an automobile without getting sick at her stomach, but she was always apologetic about this frailty, never, as she might well have been, reproachful. She tried patiently at all times to understand man's way of life, the rolling of his wheels, the raising of his voice, the ringing of his bells, his way of searching out with lights the dark, protecting corners of the night, his habit of building his beds inside walls high above the nurturing earth. She refused, with all courtesy, to accept his silly notion that it is better to bear puppies in a place made of machined wood and clean blue cloth than in the dark and warm dirt beneath the oak flooring of the barn. The poodle was hand in glove with natural phenomena. She raised two litters of puppies, 11 each time, taking them in her stride the way she took the lightning and the snow. One of these litters, which arrived ahead of schedule, was discovered under the barn floor by a little girl of four. The child gaily displayed on her right forearm the almost invisible and entirely painless marks of teeth, which had gently induced her to put down the live black toys she had found and wanted to play with. The poodle had no vices that I can think of unless you could count her incurable appetite for the tender tips of the young asparagus in the garden and for the black raspberries when they ripened on the bushes in the orchard. Sometimes, as punishment for her depredations, she walked into bees' nests or got her long, shaggy ears tangled in fence wire. She never snarled about the penalties of existence or whimpered about the trials and grotesqueries of life with man. She accepted gracefully the indignities of the clipping machine, which in her maiden days periodically made a clown of her for the dog shows, in accordance with the stupid and unimaginative notion, inherited from the drunken Romans, that this most sensitive and dignified of animals is his heart a fool. The poodle, which can look as husky as a briard when left shaggy, is an outdoors dog and can hold its own in the field with the best of the retrievers, including the Labrador. The poodle won a great many ribbons in her bench days and once went best of breed at Madison Square Garden, but she would have traded all her medals for a dish of asparagus. She knew it was showtime when a red rubber bib was tied around her neck. That meant a ride in a car. I used to ride with her in the rumble seat, and once on our way to Newport when the rain came down suddenly, there was I with one hand on the poodle's shoulder and the other holding over her a bright green parasol. The highways of New England have, I am sure, seldom beheld a more remarkable sight. Like the great Gammire of Tarkington's gentle Julia, the poodle I knew sometimes seemed about to bridge the mysterious and conceivably narrow gap that separates instinct from reason. She could take part in your gaiety and your sorrow. She trembled to your uncertainties and lifted her head at your assurances. There were times when she seemed to come close to a pitying comprehension of the whole troubled scene and what lies ticking behind it. If poodles, who can walk so easily upon their hind legs, ever do learn the little tricks of speech and reason, I should not be surprised if they made a better job of it than man, who would seem to be slowly slipping back to all fours in spite of Van Wyck Brooks and Lewis Mumford and Robert Frost. The poodle kept her sight, her hearing, and her figure up to her quiet and dignified end she knew that the hand was upon her, and she accepted it with a grave and unapprehensive resignation. This, her dark, intelligent eyes seem to be trying to tell me, is simply the closing of full circle. This is the flower that grows out of beginning. This, not to make it too hard for you, friend, is as natural as eating the raspberries 
and raising the puppies and riding into the rain. Memorial by James Thurber. In New York, I'm Keith Olbermann. Please have a great weekend. Good night and good luck.